What is up everybody? I am Axel Beats here for Anime Uproar and today we're going to be talking about one of the most mysterious elements of the One Piece story. The Will of D is something we've seen across 10 different characters and with the end of the story quickly approaching, we're sure to see the remaining members shake the world to its very core. Before we get into it though, you know the drill if you're enjoying the One Piece content on this channel. Remember to let us know by leaving a like, as well as a comment saying who your favorite member of the D-Clan is. You can also subscribe to support the channel as well. It's a totally free way to help us out, and it makes a huge difference for us with the YouTube algorithm. Finally, this video will contain manga spoilers, so please proceed with caution, you have been warned. Alright, so first off, let's talk about what the D-Clan is, and what implications they have for the One Piece story. Way back in the Void Century when the world government set up their control, the D-Clan were likely the people who stood against them. And while the Ancient Kingdom remains to be a mystery, they passed down their beliefs and their dreams through the Will of D, marked through the middle D initial in the clan's names. At their core though, those who bear the initial D should be considered the enemy of the world government, or as Rocinante described it, they are the natural enemies of God, which in this case likely means the Celestial Dragons. But what does the D stand for? There are a couple theories floating around, but no conclusive answer yet. The most likely options are going to be Dreams, a major theme throughout the One Piece story as a whole that stands in the way of the world government's iron grip, Destiny, the thing that members of the D-Clan seem to be able to alter, and Dawn, the marking of something new and the title given to the beginning of the One Piece story through Romance Dawn. Because One Piece is a Japanese story, it's pretty likely that the D will stand for a simple English word as well, as Oda specifically selected the letter D rather than a Japanese character. And for that English word to have an impact on Japanese audiences, it needs to be something that they'll all be able to recognize, which is why Dawn is where I cast my own vote here. There are of course other fan theories, people think things like Dragon Slayer, Danger, Destruction, Dracula, the guesses change from time to time, but most of these I'm not a big fan of. Regardless of the specific word though, we know that every character with the D initial seems to be destined to shake the world and bring about or cause a massive shift. Another trait that I want to mention before talking about the actual characters is that those with the Will of D seem to smile both when faced with life-threatening circumstances and as they're actually passing away. Famously, we saw Roger smiling at his own execution, Luffy smiling as Buggy was about to behead him, Jaguar D. Saul smiling when he was being frozen, Porcus D. Rouge smiling when she named Ace just before dying, Ace smiled when he died, Law smiling when Dofi pointed a gun at his heart, etc, 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 it happens all the time. So at least to some degree there does seem to be this idea that dying happy is among the D-Clan traits. This obviously creating ties to both Odin, who died smiling, with Wano having big ties to the Void Sentry and Joy Boy, and of course Joy Boy himself, who has his iconic smile and is a prominent player through the Void Century. While we don't know if Joy Boy himself had a D in his name, it's at least implied that he's very connected to the D-Clan, just as it is for Wano as a whole. An interesting side note here is that the only member of the D-Clan who actually does fear his own death and has been seen cowering in moments of impending doom is Marshall D. Teach, Blackbeard. Finally, the biggest power that the D-Clan has to offer is their charisma and ability to draw in and make friends wherever they go, something that Mihawk even described as the most dangerous power in the sea when he sees it emerging in Luffy. But with that said, let's talk about the actual D-Clan members that we met in the One Piece story. As I mentioned earlier, we know of 10 so far. Monkey D. Luffy, Monkey D. Dragon, Monkey D. Garp, Gold D. Roger, Portgus D. Rouge, Portgus D. Ace, Jaguar D. Saul, Trafalgar D. Waterlaw, Marshall D. Teach, and Rox D. Zebek. And what's interesting is that every one of these characters, with maybe the exception of Saul, are mysteries within the show and tend to have major points of interest to fans or offer big twists to their own personal story. Despite meeting Roger in the first panel of the manga, it was hundreds of chapters until we really learned anything about him, let alone getting to see a flashback. Garp is the hero of the marines, but we didn't learn why until just recently. What's the deal with Teach? 
Dragon, and Zebek. We again know nothing about them almost to this day, despite them being huge players in the story. And even the characters we are familiar with, who we get to spend time with, are all mysteries in themselves. Luffy's real Devil Fruit was just announced after over a thousand chapters with him. Ace's father was a mystery until Marineford, and Law offers the question of who he will use the immortality operation on. Even in the less interesting characters though, like Saul, you get this question of how the D-Clan reaches into other races. Saul was a giant, so where else could the D-Clan be found? And while the term clan seems to imply some kind of family, how does it seem to cross this racial line? Finally, Rouge, a character that we barely saw at all, has the question of how the hell she survived that insane pregnancy. Alright, the last one's kind of a joke, but all the same, these are all the characters who are the most interesting in the show and who make us ask the most questions. What we do know, though, is that each of these characters has changed the world, and we're going to be starting with the most recent addition to the D-Clan that we know of, Rox D. Zebek. Zebek was the Roger of Roger's day, a man who wanted to be the ruler of the seas and the captain of the strongest crew in history. But being strong isn't enough to justify the D initial. We obviously don't know a ton about Zebek's life, but we do know that this man united Edward Newgate, Charlotte Linlin, Kaido, and Shiki, which is insane. These are the strongest people that ruled the next generation, and even the least impressive of them, Shiki? has the legacy of being one of Roger's greatest rivals and being the first prisoner in Impel Down. The only way that Rox's crew could have been any crazier is if Roger himself had joined in, and that all stems down to Rox himself. It seems like something about him being captain allowed people to develop to their potential, and growing into pirates capable of becoming legendary. The strongest man alive Whitebeard, Big Mom, the strongest creature in the world Kaido, and the Golden Lion. While they are all Goliaths in their own rights, all of their stories stem back to being on Rox's crew. And in the abstract, this also meant that Rox enabled these people to do everything that they would in the future. Kaido's conquering of Wano, Big Mom's control over Totland, and everything in between. Beyond that, for Rox to actually be defeated, the world government would have to join forces with pirates, and needed the help of Roger to take him down. Meaning this was likely the starting point for the world government understanding that they weren't able to control things independently anymore, which would likely be the seeds from which the warlord system would grow. And this warlord program was inherently corrupt, allowing dangerous pirates to go without supervision, and would allow Blackbeard to cause the Marine Ford incident and storm Impel down without having any trouble along the way. It would allow Dofi to conquer Dressrosa, and Crocodile to take over Alabasta. Inadvertently, the Warlord system would also have some benefit to Luffy in several ways as well, though. Being something that connected him to Jinbei, it allowed Boa Hancock to go unchecked and for Luffy to have a place to train during the time skip. It had Vivi crossing paths with Luffy as she worked for Crocodile, and put Kuma in a place where he could save the Straw Hats on Sabaody. The interesting thing here is that with the D-Clan, it's very often that they act as the first domino, and you can trace their impact to every other part of the story. If you want to hyper-focus on one of these warlord paths, you could go something like this. Rox inspired the world government to work together with pirates, which leads to the warlord system. This warlord system picks up Jinbei, who allows Arlong to go free once he becomes a warlord. Arlong then goes out to Kokoyashi Village, where he takes things over, holds Nami prisoner and offers her the ability to buy back Kokoyashi Village for 100 million berries, and this leads her to stealing from other pirates and finding Luffy along the way. Luffy then goes on to beat Arlong and earn his first bounty. There are so many tangential paths that stem from every individual D-Clan member, and it really is just a system of dominoes hitting one after another. The Rocks God Valley incident also earned Monkey D. Garp the title of Hero of the Marine and proved Roger to be the most capable pirate on the ocean. After all, not only did he defeat Rox, but he defeated all of those future legends as well. Again, we don't know much more about Rox at this point, but I guarantee there is more to his story, likely involving Blackbeard. We also don't specifically see his death, so we don't know if he was smiling, but I would be willing to bet that there is more to his death as well. Moving on from there, let's go to Roger. Roger would be the first man to sail the seas and reach Laugh Tale since the Void Century. Like Rox, Roger's crew also held people who could change the world in their own rights. The future Yonko Shanks, 
the future warlord Buggy D. Clown, the protectors of Zo and Red Scabbards Inu Arashi and Nekomomushi, the lighthouse keeper Dr. Crocus, the hero of Wano Kozuki Odin and his time-traveling wife Toki, and while not being official members of his crew, Momonosuke and Hiyori would both be born on his ship as well, with Hiyori being instrumental in taking down Orochi and freeing her people, while Momo would go on to support Luffy as he defeated Kaido, and as Chapter 1051 described, he will be someone who one day will be known far and wide as one of Wano's greatest leaders. Not that Roger himself was a slouch, competing with some of the craziest pirates in history without having a devil fruit of his own. Roger was a good enough swordsman to overpower Odin with one swing, and he had access to all types of hockey. We don't know any unique or specific details about what that meant for Roger, but we do know that he could coat his sword, Ace, with armament, and his conquerors was strong enough to clash with Whitebeards and shake an entire island. We however don't really see him using observation, though it has been stated that he has it. Finally, Roger has the ability to hear the voice of all things, something which made him able to understand and even write in the language of the Poneglyphs, as well as hearing the voices of Sea Kings. Of course, Roger's greatest impact on the world would be at his execution, where he inspired the Great Age of Piracy by telling the world about his hidden treasure and the One Piece. And while in most cases the will of D is more of a spiritual or belief-based thing, we do see his will being directly passed on through his straw hat, which is now on Luffy's head. Of course, Roger would meet Porcus D. Rouge during his life, and naturally, they did the old hanky-panky. Both of them, pretty hot. Here is where Rouge, through pure force of will of D, held more than a double-length pregnancy to ensure that Gold D. Ace could be born safely ultimately resulting in her own death from, you know, giving birth to someone who is effectively a one-year-old. This action, though, did allow Ace to be born, and through that simple fact, she did help in shaping the future. Luckily, Monkey D. Garp, who was Roger's rival in life, was also kind of a big softy. Roger had asked him to take care of Ace, arguing that a father's sin are no fault of the son, and that Garp's morals shouldn't allow him to let an innocent child die. So Garp brings Ace to the dawn, and again, this allows him to live and shape the future going forward. Garp himself, as I mentioned, was instrumental in defeating Rocks and became the hero of the Marines. So to say that he changed the world simply through his actions with Ace, Rocks, Roger, and Rouge is easy enough to argue. Though we can also add into Garp's orbit, Kobe taking him under his wing, and developing him into a hero on his own merit as well, and helping him turn into someone who was strong enough to become an active member of S.W.O.R.D. along Drake. And while we don't see Garp doing a ton of things in the series, we do know that he is crazy strong. He was Roger's rival, with Roger saying that they each almost killed each other several times. So it's fair to say that Garp was at least in the ballpark of Roger in his prime. He was offered a job as an admiral despite not having a devil fruit, and for contrast, the other admirals that we've seen have had things like insane logias and the ability to control gravity to the point where you can call a meteor to the earth. So I'd say that's pretty high praise. And in some instances, we see Garp even going above the other admirals as he was able to swat away Marco while he was using his fruit, despite Akainu and Kizuru seeming to struggle to do the same. Again, no devil fruit, just being tremendously strong. We see him punching or throwing insanely heavy objects like giant cannonballs and chains with ease, and he even said himself that he crushed eight mountains while training to fight Chinjao. In terms of hockey, we know that Garp has armament, and Kobe was sent to see him as a master for observation, so it's implied that he knows that as well. And while we don't see Garp using Conquerors, I'd say it's probably pretty possible for him to have it, but I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't. Also, just gonna throw in some quick headcanon here, but I personally would like Garp to eventually be the one to kill Akainu. We see him needing to be held back by Sengoku when Akainu was going after Ace, and the day is quickly coming where the Fleet Admiral and Luffy's paths will be crossing, and personally, I don't think that Garp is going to watch a second grandson die, but that's just something that I would like to see happen. If he did defeat Akainu in this way, it would definitely be something that shook up the world. In a more canonical sense though, Garp is in a pretty unique position of being the Vice Admiral working for Celestial Dragons that he hates. So much so that he even refused to become an Admiral because it would give them greater control over him. Which also raises an interesting question. There are only ever three Admirals. At the start of the story, those were Akainu, Aokiji, and Kizaru. 
If Garp had accepted the station of Admiral, one of those would never have been promoted. And as each of them offers their own distinct sense of justice, it would drastically change the balance of power within the Marines themselves. We've seen how Akainu functions, for example. He is quite literally a kill first and ask questions later kind of person when it comes to what he believes to be just. Taking away his power would surely change how things played out in countless incidents. It would also have meant that Aokiji never would have had to fight him for the position of Fleet Admiral, and he would have never lost or left the Marines as a result. Similar arguments could have been made for if Aokiji or Kizuru didn't make it into becoming Admirals, but the point still stands. Garp making the choice to not be an Admiral shaped the Marines as we know it today. Now, we have been circling a character for a little bit now, so let's finally talk about Ace. The child born in secret, the heir to Roger's bloodline, the second division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, the adopted grandson of Monkey D. Garp, and the final surviving big brother that Luffy has. And oh, did that last one not quite age well. The point is, Ace was a super important character that's tied to some of the most influential people in the story. And that doesn't even bring in his ties to Wano or Yamato. Not to mention, Ace had the Mera Mera Nomi, the Logia fruit which allowed him to turn into, create, and manipulate fire. Ace doesn't have a ton of fights in the series, but we do see him doing some phenomenal stuff in the little that we do. For example, in his first showing off of his fruit, we see him destroying a line of ships with a single fiery fist. It's not just his fruit though, Ace also has Conquerors, which he awakened as a child, but as far as armament and observation, we still just don't know much. In One Piece Novel A, we see him using armament to fight Vice Admiral Draw, and observation is kind of in the same boat. Ace trains with Thatch to learn it, but we don't really ever see it being used. Which is why, when Blackbeard defeats him and brings him to Impel Down, the world begins to change. Ace was slated for execution, and as a result, all of the world's powers, save for Big Mom and some of the supernovas, converge on a single point of Marineford. The world government brings an army along with all three admirals, all of their vice admirals, Mihawk, Doflamingo, Gecko Moria, a small division of pacifistas, and Boa Hancock is sort of on their side sometimes, depending on who's in her way. And all of these phenomenally powerful people waged war against every division of the Whitebeard Pirates, Luffy, and the escape prisoners of Impel Down including Crocodile, Jinbei, Ivankov, and Buggy. Not just those two groups, though. Blackbeard's crew, along with his newly acquired prisoner crewmates like Shiryu, Avalo Pizarro, Katarina Devon, and San Juan Wolf, all arrive to capitalize on the war as well, ultimately killing Whitebeard and stealing his devil fruit. Trafalgar Law shows up, then Shanks and the red-haired pirates who had arrived after stopping Kaido, who was also on the way to show up, and luckily Shanks does manage to both stop Kaido and end the war as a whole. Genuinely, unless the Big Mom pirates arrived with the other supernovas and the remaining Straw Hats, every relevant character in the story was there. This is the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate of Pirate Wars, and it all started with Ace being captured and put up for execution. Ace's death, though, did two specific things as well. Firstly, it broke Luffy, leading to a scene where Jinbei would need to get him back on his feet in Amazon Lily, and where Luffy would go on to make the decision to spend two years on Ruskaina with Rayleigh training. The other point being that Whitebeard would go on to sacrifice himself so all of the rest of his men could get away, and declaring that the One Piece was real, reigniting the Great Pirate Era. I mentioned Blackbeard a bunch there as well, and he has a huge impact on the story. Blackbeard is a schemer, with the original plan being to join the Whitebeard Pirates and bide his time until they came across the devil fruit that he was looking for, the Yomi Yomi Nomi. This fruit would eventually be discovered by Thatch, and Blackbeard would kill him to steal the fruit for himself before defecting from the crew. This inspires Ace to chase him down, which Blackbeard uses as an opportunity to capture Ace, allowing Blackbeard himself to become a warlord and act freely, all while triggering the Marineford War and giving himself access to Impel Down. There, he would steal all the new criminals for his crew, and now a stronger force than ever, he could enter the war and steal Whitebeard's devil fruit, allowing him to become a Yonko, a position that gives him so much power that he can do really anything he wants until he's ready to head to Laugh Tale or topple the world government and become ruler of the seas, just as Zebek wanted to be in the past. 
Speaking of, we don't know what their connection is between Blackbeard and Sevik. We know it will be fleshed out, and I'm sure it will add a lot more to Blackbeard's story. As of right now, Blackbeard is easily one of the biggest threats in the story. The Darkness Fruit allows Blackbeard to swallow up the world around him into black holes. But it also allows him to turn off other people's Devil Fruit when he touches them, as we saw with Ace. It's unclear if the Darkness Fruit is also a catalyst for Blackbeard being able to steal Devil Fruits, but that could definitely be why he wanted this fruit specifically. Of course, that is just a theory. Regardless of the real method of Devil Fruit theft, he's also accrued a crew full of stolen abilities as a result. And finally, Blackbeard also has the Gura Gura Nomi, a fruit which is said to be able to destroy the entire world by creating shockwaves that would cause it to quake and split apart. Interestingly, Blackbeard has not been shown or stated to have Conqueror's Hockey yet, though I'd imagine that he does. We know that he does have Observation Hockey specifically, as he uses it to gauge Luffy's growth, and we know that Armament Hockey is also something he has, as we learned from the Fever cards. And while not being part of his arsenal directly, I do want to talk about Teach's body. We know that Teach has a very strange body, this is something that gets brought up quite a bit throughout the series, but this causes things like him not needing to sleep. Furthermore, when leaving Jaya, Luffy and Zoro refer to Blackbeard as not a he, but a they, a group of people. And this might tie into why he's able to have multiple Devil Fruits, despite no one else being able to do so. There are several theories around all of this, be it that Blackbeard is actually three people or three personalities, yada yada. But whatever it is, this weird body allows him to have multiple Devil Fruits, and when you combine that with his ability to strategize, it makes him a very deadly force. Next up, we have Luffy's father and Garp's son, Monkey D. Dragon. Again, this is a character that, despite being a fan favorite, we know nothing about. Like, we've seen this dude maybe a dozen times in the entire series if we're lucky, and maybe total he's been in enough pages to fill up one chapter. And all we really know about him is that he's the leader of the revolutionaries and who he's related to, and that's kind of it. Even so, though, the fact that he runs the revolutionary army and is the most wanted man in the world speaks volumes. Whitebeard was the strongest person in the world. Big Mom runs an empire, Kaido is the strongest creature, and Blackbeard has two Devil Fruits as a result of making a fool of the world government. But none of these characters are the most wanted. Instead, Dragon is. Dragon represents something to the world government that they fear more than all of the Yonko, and more than being made into fools. And that's because Dragon is the human embodiment of the will of D. He is an agent specifically working to change the world, and bring about a new age, a new dawn, if you will. So while we don't know anything really specifically about what he's done or what he will do, it's very easy to understand what he is and why he's considered to be dangerous. And that doesn't even bring into account his abilities. We can assume that he does have armament hockey as he managed to grab Smoker back in Logtown, and like Luffy, it's probably safe to say that he does at least have observation, though Conqueror's is probably on the table as well. The big thing with Dragon is his storms. We don't know if it's a Devil Fruit or not, but we have seen it several times where a green storm will arrive just before Dragon does. And there seems to be some kind of control to it, as a lightning bolt specifically saves Luffy just before he's executed. Like I said, it's unconfirmed, but if Dragon does have a Devil Fruit that controls the wind or controls storms, that's pretty huge for a pirate-based story. Our next D is Jaguar D. Saul, a former Marine Vice Admiral who allowed Nico Olivia to escape the Marine's clutches, and who saved Nico Robin from the assault on Ohara. By Saul making active choices to abandon his post, for what he believed to be right, he allowed Robin to eventually cross paths with Crocodile and then Luffy, and as we know, Robin is the last person on the planet who can read Poneglyphs. She is one of the most important characters in the world. She's the key to finding Laugh Hill and learning the truth about the Void Sentry, and as such, Saul opens the door to allowing the truth to be revealed, and likely to the ultimate downfall of the world government. Second to last, we have Trafalgar Law, the character who sets in motion the plan to take down the Yonko Kaido, something which in itself will impact not only the country of Wano, but also the entire world. Law also made a name for himself during the Rocky Port incident, the same one that made Kobe into a hero, and not to mention, Law also was a warlord that leveraged that position to put him in a place where he could start his takedown of Doflamingo. However, while all of these things are tremendous, 
I don't think any of them are going to be the reason that Law changes the world. Instead, I think that's going to come down to his Devil Fruit. Law has the Ape Ape Nomi, the Devil Fruit, which allows him to freely manipulate the people and objects around him. And while that is super powerful on its own, the Devil Fruit actually earned the title of the Ultimate Devil Fruit for a different reason. At the expense of Law's life, he can perform something called the Immortality Operation, granting someone else eternal youth. And this is something that could have insane ramifications, especially if it ends up in the wrong hands. And it's something that would never be introduced if it wasn't going to play a role in the story at some point. As such, I think that the method or choice on who Law chooses to perform this surgery on will be the reason that he changes the world. Conversely, we could look at someone like Imusama, who seems like they already are immortal, possibly, so maybe that had been performed on them by a previous Ape Ape user. On top of that, we have Blackbeard, who knows how to steal Devil Fruits, and could easily force feed the Ape Ape to one of his own henchmen, and then force them to sacrifice their own lives to give him immortality. The ways in which this fruit could shift the balance of power in the world forever are countless, and it's obvious that it will eventually play a massive role in how this story reaches its conclusion. And finally, we have Monkey D. Luffy, the protagonist of the series, the inheritor of Roger's will, the descendant of the hero of the Marines and the world's most wanted man, brother to Portgis D. Ace, the user of the mythical Nika fruit, the return of Joy Boy, and someone who has challenged and changed the fate of those around him throughout his entire journey. Luffy has done so many phenomenal things in the series, but the greatest strength he has is that he can manipulate those around him. He draws them into becoming his allies, makes them believe that their impossible dreams could be a reality, or tear down the nightmares that they are living through. And we see this as early as Shell's Town when he meets Kobe, turning him from a scared and wimpy brat into someone who is willing to stand up for their dream and make the first step towards attaining it. We see this with every one of his crewmates, reinforcing Zoro's belief in becoming the world's greatest swordsman. This to the point where Zoro even humbles himself into eventually asking Mihawk to train him. We see Luffy helping Sanji realize that he'll never reach the All Blue if he's stuck in the Baratier. Luffy frees Kokuyashi Village from the tyrant Arlong. He does the same thing in Drum Kingdom with Waffle, Alabasta with Crocodile, and Skypiea with Eneru, and so many other places. Be they kings, warlords, or gods, Luffy will stand with those around him to battle tyranny, create freedom, and turn dreams into a reality. Luffy's fruit, the mythical Nika, allows him to have a rubbery body that resists electricity and is able to move and bend in any way he sees fit. He is limited only by his imagination. At first, this is all very simple stuff, but of course we do see his imagination being turned more and more into reality, as he includes things like Gear 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and finally 5th. Like Roger, Luffy also has access to all forms of hockey. We've never seen him coat a weapon with armament, but he can cover his body to the point where he's nearly invulnerable in Tank Man, he can use Ryuo, he has Observation, which allows him to see slightly into the future, and his Conquerors is strong enough at this point where he can enforce his attacks with it, like he did against Kaido. Unlike other characters, I can't go arc by arc and tell you how Luffy has changed the world, because he does it in small ways so often that I'd be here forever. But all of those ripples add up, and he makes them in every kingdom that he crosses. And the waves that he creates spread to impact people and places worldwide. He is the savior of the downtrodden and the oppressed, and it's what makes him the perfect inheritor for the Nika Devil Fruit, and for the title of Joy Boy. The Nika Fruit has the power to turn imagination and personal spirit into reality. And that is the will of D made into a tangible force. Standing up for those under tyranny, making dreams come true, the sun god Nika represented a change for all of those that he liberated. They wouldn't be slaves anymore and they could start new chapters of their own lives. Fittingly, the sun god would bring about a new dawn for all of those who crossed paths with him. And that is what the will of D is all about. And then there's Blackbeard and Zebek which seem to actively go against all of that, which at first does seem like a contradiction. However, that's kind of an integral theme of One Piece as a whole. There's a balance to everything. The Marines are painted as this evil group, but then you have people like Garp, Aokiji, Kobe, Smoker, Saul, 
and so many others who prove that there are good people there too. Pirates are supposed to be bloodthirsty, greedy monsters, but then you have the Straw Hats and Shanks and Law and how many other good pirates from along the way who just want to be free and follow their dreams. No group is a monolith, and this is a story of individuals. So just as most of the D go against the world nobles as a result of following their dreams, not all dreams are positive. And Blackbeard wanting to throw the world into chaos does technically get rid of the world government, it just doesn't bring things to a better place. But that's gonna wrap things up for this look at the users of the Will of D and how they affect the world. This has been a really interesting topic for me since beginning One Piece, so I really hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Of course, if you did, remember to leave a like and comment down below, and maybe even consider subscribing for more great One Piece content in the future. You can also follow Anime Uproar at Anime Uproar on Twitter and Instagram, or you can check out my own channel called Axel Beats. But with all of that being said, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, remember to stay excellent.